but there are connections across the whole world and, and everything's connected. That ecological viewpoint of connectivity, about humans being part of nature, about the, the physical environment and the living environment being intricately intertwined, uh, has of course shaped everything. And, and I like to think of sustainability as the, the sort of the wedding cake idea of, of the, uh, the, the environment, the biosphere, the living world underpinning our societies, which underpin our economies. Around 80% of people who listen to this podcast haven't hit the follow button. If I could ask you for a small favour, if you do enjoy our conversations, please do hit that follow button on your app. It would help us in the show more than I could possibly say. Thank you and enjoy the conversation. Thank you so much for spending the time and uh, hosting us here in the Botany Building. No problem, in, you're very welcome. Trinity. Thank you so much. Um, so in the, the conversation we've had about, um, you know, botany and uh, nature, um, it's pretty clear to me that you've got more than just um, a, an academic interest uh, in, in the whole subject. There's a real kind of love and passion there. Could you tell us, just before we start, like um, a little bit about your, your journey, like how you fell in love with, with, with the whole, this, whole, this whole space, with nature? Oh, falling in love with nature. Um, Oh, well, I grew up in a village in the countryside on the edge of a village surrounded by fields and, you know, we'd, we'd take walks and my dad would go bird watching. My mom taught me the, the names of the flowers. Um, we would go on holidays, camping and hiking. So I guess I've always been in nature. I think falling in love with nature was when I started to study ecology and when I started to understand the complexity and the intricacy and the connectedness in nature. And I think that really sparked something in me to, you know, you look in a Petri dish of soil and it's not just dirt. There's a whole ecosystem in there. Uh, you look at a forest, you know, look at the structure of the canopy and the different species. And I think all of that complexity really made me want to delve in a bit further. Um, and, and, you know, people often ask me, because I focus on, most of my career I focus on insects. Um, you know, as a kid, did I chase butterflies? And, and you know, absolutely not. I, I, I hated anything that crawled or buzzed. It was, that wasn't my interest. It was only later on when I started looking at these animals closely. And you look at an insect down a microscope and you look at its mouth parts and you look at its legs and its wings and suddenly it's the most fascinating thing. And there are so many different kinds of insects and they're all different and they all do fascinating things. So I think it was starting to understand that diversity as well as that complexity that made me fall in love with nature. Brilliant. And as you went through that kind of that journey, uh, where you were kind of, really trying to seeing all the connections and all mm -hmm. the you know the, the differences in the ecosystems and how it all works and how like even like the the, the body of a, of an insect worked and how it, how it all worked in harmony, um, did that change the way that you looked at the world in general, like how you treated life in general, and kind of more kind of philosophical point of view? Yeah, yeah. Uh, undoubtedly, that's that's sort of that ecological understanding of the connections at different scales. So, as, you know, you think about your, your petri dish of soil or your, your, your spoonful of soil from the ground, you know, that's a very small scale. And there's connections in, in that little ecosystem. But there are connections across the whole world and, and everything's connected. And I think that very much then, that, that ecological viewpoint of connectivity about, the, about humans being part of nature, um, about the, the physical environment and the living environment being intricately intertwined, uh, has of course shaped everything I do and everything that I think about. So I think it, it, being an ecologist gives you a fantastic perspective it's kind of overwhelming, <laughs> um, but it does give you that perspective about the, the, the fundamental importance of nature in our lives and, and that, that connectivity. Yeah. yeah, as you said yourself, it's our, it's our, it's our, it's our system. It's our, it, is, it is our life support it's system. It's our life support <laughs> system, absolutely. And I often say that, you know, people yeah. say, why is nature important? Mm -hmm. I said, well, we wouldn't be here without yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. you, you know, the air we breathe, the food we eat, the, the water we drink, the things that we absolutely need for life not just we as human beings, but all other uh, living creatures on the planet. It all comes from Mother Earth or nature or, or you know, whatever you want to call it, whatever your sort of philosophy is, we're all rooted in it and we're all part of it. Um, and that can lead us nicely on to the area of, of biodiversity, uh, which is going to be, would be one of the, the core topics we're going to be talking about today. Now, it's an idea that seems to have finally kind of 
gotten into the mainstream, um, but it seems to have gotten into the mainstream as more of a kind of you know cuddly, nice to have. Let's let, let let's try try and preserve the polar bears type of idea as opposed to something that is really existential. Uh, could you kind of start by kind of defining the the, the idea of biodiversity to to kind of non academics? Yes, I mean biodiversity. It's it, it's just a it's short for the word biological diversity. So we're talking about the variety of life. So it's the variety of life um, at the large scale. So the variety of different habitats that we have. So you know the the fact that we have grasslands and forests and coasts and deep sea. That's a variety of life of different types of life, often driven by physical environment. And then it's the variety of life that lives in those habitats. So the different plants, the animals, the microorganisms, all of those those connections that are going on uh, at the species level and then within species it's the variety at the genetic level the fact that when we don't look the same uh, the fact that all individuals are, are, are unique because of their genetic makeup uh, and that genetic diversity is also really important um, and, and so it's part of biodiversity so when we talk about biodiversity it just means that variety of life I think now you, you know and, and even in the last uh, I'd say maybe in the last three, four, five years, the, the biodiversity crisis has become much more well known. Um, it, it, I still don't think people really get what biodiversity is. Um, does that matter? Does it matter if we use the word biodiversity or we use the word nature? Um, I don't know. Biodiversity means something specific to me as a scientist. It means the variety of life. Um, but it's, it's certainly becoming more recognized but I think because it's complicated and 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 people don't really know what to do about it I think that's 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 one of the issues and um, could you tell us why why it matters both to, to, on a kind of existential human level but also to to business and like to to us in our day-to-day -day? yeah I mean when we talk about the the sort of the value of nature or, or, or why that that diversity in nature is important I think it's two slightly separate things I think we can all you know appreciate that we need plants because they they take in carbon dioxide and produce oxygen uh, they they produce biomass that's the base of the food chain you know we get that we need green stuff we need plants that's that's fundamental to, to our existence on the planet um, we then we need the, the the things that happen in ecosystems so animals eating those plants plants and animals dying and being broken down and decomposed composed and their organic materials being recycled in the system you know you can kind of you can get that's all that's important for for life um, do we need diversity you know could we not just have one species of plant and one species of animal eating it and, and one species of decomposer um, well yes in in a very small uh, context the reason we need diversity is because the world is so varied different species are, are able to cope with and, and work better in different conditions. Um, but we also need backups. So when there's changes, uh, then we need, you know, if we're just one species and, and it's suddenly it's too cold or it's too wet or it's, uh, there's a disease that affects it, then that species is gone. So we need backups. So diversity gives us those backups, um, but it also makes the whole system work more efficiently. Um, and you, you, the, the issue of do we just need green stuff or do we need diversity is something that's kind of complex and it's very context specific. So in one place you, you might need 10 species, in another you might need 150. So, so, so we need nature, we need diversity for, for, for ecosystems to function, for, for oxygen, for, for uh, food, for, for all those fundamental things. To bring that then into kind of, you know, business, you know, how do we actually need biodiversity in our day-to-day -day business? A lot of businesses, um, particularly in the tertiary sector, don't depend directly on raw materials. Um, and so they find it very hard to see where their connection comes. Um, but if you think about every business activity and break it down, you know, everything that a business brings in, every um, uh, procurement decision that's made, that has an impact on biodiversity. Uh, pretty much every business, people are drinking coffee. Uh, coffee uh, comes from plants that grow in tropical places that are pollinated by insects that are then processed and transported. And so it's an indirect dependency, but it's still there. So then that's, you know, that's, that's just a flippant example. Uh, paper, um, construction materials, the water that heats and cools buildings, you, you know, so, Every business has some kind of dependency on nature. 
but also every business has some kind of impact on nature because every business produces something at the end um, and they produce their product but they also produce byproducts waste um, and that waste then has an impact on nature so it's very it's difficult for a business to, you know an IT company to say well actually my business has nothing to do with biodiversity it does there's always impacts and there's always dependencies so it's recognizing those impacts and dependencies um, and, and many of them may be indirect uh, and, and considering those in, in the business models. If you have a look at kind of media reporting in this, this whole area, it's, yeah, it's really confused, it's really mixed. Like yep. you've got some reports that say six mass, uh, mass extinctions coming along, we're all doomed. Another saying, oh, it's wonderful, we've got some beavers released in, 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 in um, you know, rewilded back into Canada, you know, the world is all fine. Can you tell us, like, what is the state of play? Um, I, I don't know what used to, word to use. I mean, people talk about mass extinctions, about catastrophic. Uh, loss of biodiversity. What we do know is for the organisms that we have data and information. So, so to, 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 to say you've lost something, you've got to know what was there in the first place. Um, so for an awful lot of biodiversity on this planet, we don't know what was there in the first place. Um, for some things, we do have good records. So for vertebrates, animals with backbones, so mammals, birds, uh, fish, reptiles and amphibians, we've got quite good records for them and for those animals we know that there have been huge declines in numbers of individuals. So in my lifetime there's been an almost 70% decline in the numbers of individuals of animals. So that's a loss of, of biomass of, of wildlife. Um, but we also know that there's been a loss in species as well. And so when we look at extinction rates of species now, they're 10 to 100 times higher than they are in the fossil record. So we know we're losing species and we're losing individuals of those species that we know enough about, which is a tiny proportion. Now you think about the vertebrates, you know, a tiny, tiny fraction of life on Earth is vertebrates. Mostly it's invertebrates and microorganisms and to be honest, we know very, very little about those. So for, for the species that we do have enough information, so for example, some of the charismatic species uh, of insect like uh, butterflies uh, and bees, we know that there have been dramatic declines um, and that there are ongoing uh, declines. So for Irish bees, for example, um, of the species that we know enough about to understand their decline, we know that a third of all the Irish bee species are at risk of extinction. So a third of species at risk of being lost from, from this island um, is, is, is quite terrifying. Uh, and when we think about the speed at which this loss has, has happened, um, you know, millions of years of evolution has led us to the diversity that we have on, on this planet. Uh, it's 10,000 years since the ice retreated from Ireland and Ireland was colonized with, with this diverse mix of species. To think that in the last few decades, in, in my own lifetime, we've had this huge loss and this decline, the 70% decline in vertebrates worldwide, is, is really quite frightening. And as non-academics with an interest in this in this subject, what are the kind of the key measures we should be trying to look at to avoid to, to separate the, the 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 hype or the the, the cuddliness from it? Yeah, it's difficult, and I think you, you know the things to look out for. The and, and I would always say this to my students: is don't make sweeping generalizations. You know, so I'm always careful to say of the species that we know something about, we know that this this is the loss, um, and and you know, and I think there is a tendency to try and obviously simplify the message and and to try and get the message across very strongly, um, but it, it's 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 who's telling that message. Um, how simplified is it? Can you pick into it a little bit, um, and and really not just you know, not just take uh, the message from one source? Uh, and I think that's for me. That's this. There's lots of different sources of information and data and ways of looking at data. Some pieces of data, some places, and saying no. Well, actually, it's fine. There's you know, there's increases in particular species in particular places. Of course, there are. There's not everything's in decline. And if we go back to our bees, we know that some bee species are actually doing fine and and you know some are even increasing in in the size of their populations but the general uh, body of evidence or the weight of evidence suggests 
that it's going in one direction and that direction is is decline. Yeah, yeah, you've got the same parallels with the whole um, you know global heating, where you've got like you know, if you look at the trend, the trend is, yeah. is it, it, it is upwards, but you know there's there's there's, there's ups variation. and downs along the way. Yeah, yeah and yeah, I think yeah. that's that's the other thing that makes this hard to to comprehend is that um, nature is inherently variable. Uh, and it varies from place to place, from season to season, from day to day. Um, and, and so it's very hard to track change. And if we think, it's, so insects, for example, they vary year to year massively according to the weather conditions. So if we're trying to track change in insect numbers, we need decades of data. By the time we've got decades of data, we're going to see the, you know, the, the, the decline. What we want to see is decades of data showing a, a reverse of that decline. Um, that's that's what we're working for. And speaking of um, of place to place, uh, when I think of um, biodiversity and protection of biodiversity, particularly, um, it's well, the first things that come to mind are protecting, like you know, the, the Amazon, the Congo, the, yeah. the Himalayas, like the the, the, the largely untouched places. Um, and when you look at it from an Irish point of view, it's like, well, aren't we too domesticated? Isn't it too late here? And I think that's one of the problems is we, we've all grown up watching uh, programmes on the TV about these far-flung, beautiful, amazing, biodiverse places. And, and you kind of think, well, that's nice. Nature's there. It's out there somewhere. It's, it's, it'll be great. It's fine. It's, it's, it's doing OK. It doesn't really matter what we do here. We're a small island. We're, we're relatively not very diverse because uh, we are a small island on, on the edge of, of the Atlantic. Um, but there's there's biodiversity everywhere. And, you know, I go back to the teaspoon of soil. You know, you, if you look at a teaspoon of soil under a microscope, it's as fascinating as a rainforest. There's as much structure and interaction and and, 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 and fascinating creatures there as, as there are in a, in, a, in a tropical rainforest. But we do, it, it, even in Ireland, you know, our coastal systems, some of our upland systems, our rivers, our meadows, you know, the little remnants of those diverse habitats that are still left are absolutely incredible it's just they're not celebrated um, and they haven't been celebrated in in our economic system in our farming system they've been seen as as um, wastes of space or you know they're termed as non-productive areas they are producing something they're producing this incredible natural system and, and lots of other benefits it's just not producing food so it's it's the way that we look at things through a very narrow um, through a very narrow lens uh, and, and of course there's there's wonderful biodiversity here we just need we need to look for it and celebrate it so um, one of uh, the kind of the key themes in your your, your work seems to be that um, Biodiversity and biodiversity loss doesn't respect borders. A bit like you know the whole, mm -hmm. the whole idea of climate as well. It doesn't uh, respect borders. Could you give us a little bit of insight into why, be like us sitting sitting in a room here, why we should be caring about uh, biodiversity loss in a distant part of the world? Uh, there's lots of lots of reasons. I suppose we, if we take the very selfish personal reasons, is is you know we're we're sitting in here. I suspect the wood on the floor and of the the bookshelves and the chairs has come from somewhere else in the world. Um, the food that we will eat for our lunch, um, you know, the, the, the food production system in Ireland, we mostly don't eat food that's been produced here in Ireland. So, you know, you think about all our, most of our fruits and vegetables uh, are imported, a lot of the grain is imported. So for actually sitting here and then eating our lunch, you know, biodiversity elsewhere has helped to produce these things. Uh, trees can't grow um, in isolation. You know, they need soil organisms, fungal uh, connections. Um, some trees need pollinators. They need natural enemies. They, they interact with the ecosystem. So, so you need biodiversity to produce the wood that, that we are sitting on right here. You need biodiversity to produce the food. So we need soil organisms to keep the soil healthy, to recycle nutrients. We need natural enemies of pests to stop the food being consumed by other organisms uh, rather than us. Uh, we need pollinators to transfer pollen between flowers so that fruits form. So we, we do directly need biodiversity elsewhere for the goods that we use every day. Um, there's lots of other reasons why, why it's important. We like to know that it's there. 
we, we fundamentally like to know, even if we're never going to see it or use it or benefit from it, we like to know that nature is there. We like to think there are orangutans in the forests of Indonesia, even if we're never going to see them or make any money from them. Um, there's the whole um, moral worth of, of, you know, these things have evolved over millions of years. Are we really going to be the generation that, that causes them not to be here for the future? Um, there's... Uh, medical reasons, um, you know, our, our physical and mental health is improved by biodiversity, both locally but also uh, globally. So if we think about um, medicines that are developed from plants and from other organisms, you know, having that wealth of diversity to draw from to, to maintain and restore our physical health is really important. And in terms of our mental health, you know, there's lots of studies that have shown that interaction with nature and, and uh, being outside and, and physical exercise as well as, as that kind of mental stimulation that comes from nature can be very good for our mental health. And, and given the mental health crises we have and the, and the, the physical health crises we have with non-communicable non diseases, that's a really good reason for, for looking after nature. Um, you know, and that's just thinking about ourselves. So there's, there's lots of reasons why I think nature is important, both immediately where we live and what we're surrounded by and what we use day to day, but also across the whole globe. But, and, but you know, we, we, we live in a global economy. Uh, we're importing and exporting products and materials all the time and, and, and things that we buy every day in the shop may have resources from lots of different places around the world that have come together. So it's again, it's that diversity. Uh, and, and I think, you know, the, the, the idea that systems work better when they're diverse, we understand that in business, we understand that in our daily lives, and it's the same in nature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as, um, as a global issue, as a global problem, uh, it seems, at least according to the media, and maybe you can, you can uh, shed a little more light on this, that there was a, a kind of significant breakthrough last year, kind of COP, uh, Biodiversity COP15 in Montreal. Yeah. Um, how do you think that that's, that, could you give your view on whether, how successful it was? And, and, and if it was successful, what's, what part of the process made it successful? Um, I, I mean, I think it was it was a big breakthrough. Um, it was, you know, for once people were talking about COP and saying, oh, you mean climate? No, no, we mean biodiversity. So for the first time, it took 15 COPs before people realised that there was a there was a biodiversity equivalent to the climate. Uh, getting global uh, political agreement to address biodiversity loss. I mean, you know, there's been that political agreement since the early 90s, but it seems to have ramped up. Uh, it's it's catching up with climate in terms of rising up the political agenda. The global framework that came out of that that that, that agreement in Montreal um, is potentially very significant. I mean, it's it's easy to be sceptical. We had uh, targets to meet for 2010, which we missed. We had targets to meet for 2020, which we missed. We've now got 2030 targets. But I, th I think we have to be hopeful. Uh, we have to recognize that that was a bit of a breakthrough moment it was it's called the paris moment for nature um th that that this global agreement actually could make a difference I, i'm being fairly cautious um because, because I, I i want to believe that it can make a difference mm -hmm. um it's certainly it's certainly gone up the political agenda there's 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 people at the very high levels talking about biodiversity where there wasn't five ten years ago so one of the key outcomes uh, was the was the thirty for thirty target. Can you tell us a little bit about that, and also whether you think it was it, it's sufficient. Yeah, so the 30 by 30 um, uh, is a target to protect 30% of land and seas by 2030 uh, and to restore 30% of degraded ecosystems by 2030. It's one of many targets, um, or, or two of two many targets. It's huge. Uh, if, if, if we could achieve that by 2030, that would make a massive positive step. Um, it's going to be very difficult to achieve. Um, it's been very difficult to implement some of the other nature regulations and directives that we've had over the last couple of decades. To, to get to this level of ecosystem protection and restoration is, is, is absolutely huge. And it's going to take everyone 
to, to, to get involved in this and I think in the media it's been very uh, polarized as that you know the farmers are going to have to take the hit on this or, or certain other um, industries or, or, or places are, are, are going to have to be the focus but really it's everyone everywhere um, and, and the way that I like to think about it is that we can all do our part if we all protect or restore 30% uh, of, of whatever area we have under our control. So whether it's our back garden, whether it's our business premises, whether it's the local park, um, if we can get that 30% in across the board, then that it might be achievable. It, you know, you can't disentangle the two actually, the climate and the biodiversity crisis, are two sides of the same coin. Um, and if it was a coin with more than two sides, there'd be other issues in there as well. You know, it's not just about climate and, and biodiversity. There's been a lot more media attention on, on the, the climate issue. Um, people are much more, I think, climate literate. Uh, again, you know, going back to that word biodiversity, most people don't know what it means. Are people nature literate? And when I think about nature, I think climate is part of nature. So it's, it's so I think there's complexity um, and and maybe just not not the clarity uh, that's that's needed for for the, for the layperson to to understand. Well, well let's take, dig a little bit more into that. Like, what is the impact uh, of diet global heating on uh, on biodiversity? Um, I mean, there's three main things. You know, as as the the global climate changes, you get changes in the distribution. Of, of species and, and, and where particular ecosystems can exist. You get changes in uh, the, the timing of, of biological events. So when uh, bud bursts happen in, happens in the spring or, or you know, when swallows return from migration, um, you know, when, when insects emerge, um, and then you get changes in the functioning of ecosystems. So how you know, that change in distribution and timing can can lead to mismatches where where uh, species that interact with one another don't occur at the same place at the same time. It can also change the rate at which plants and animals grow. Uh, can change the the actual nutritional content of, of of different organisms, and that changes then the, the the trophic interactions that happen in ecosystems. So you get this 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 space time and activity changes in biodiversity as a result of changing climates and then you also get the knock on so so as the the ecosystem changes then it, it's less able to cope and adapt to climate change but also is less able to help mitigate climate change. So if we think of our um, upland peatland systems, for example, if it gets hot and dry, they dry out. That means they're not um, retaining and holding on to carbon, but actually uh, releasing carbon. So, so you then get a, a negative spiral uh, in, in, in the wrong direction, rather than, than biodiversity in these peatlands being a, a sponge and a positive um, uh, in terms of climate mitigation, you get the, the opposite happening. So th there's a lot of uh, intricacy and interaction, and we know that um, biodiversity, you know, in an, in an urban context, so home street trees, for example, can help to um, ameliorate hot summers. Um, we know that having um, urban vegetation trees, other vegetation can help in terms of management of flooding, in terms of runoff, in terms of stabilization of the soil. Uh, you know, so we know we, we can recognize how important nature and biodiversity is in an urban context in terms of uh, adaptation to climate. In, in a rural context as well, if we look at uh, the farming system, if you've just got one species of grass in, in, your, in your pasture um, and, and there's a dry spell or a drought, uh, and that species dies back. If you've got lots of species, then one of them might be able to cope with the dry spell and the, or the drought. You know, so so we can start to see how having diversity in a in an agricultural system is important as well. Or you know, one crop might fail, but another crop survives. So so the, so diversity is a really important part of our adaptation strategy, as well as part of this, this, this mitigation, trying to slow down climate change in the first place. So, so the, the climate and the biodiversity issues shouldn't be separate. They, they should be brought together. And also in terms of what we're doing to mitigate uh, climate change and adapt to climate change, needs to be done in, in a way that's, uh, that's 
thinking about and understanding biodiversity. Um, you know, if we'd say, okay, we want to plant loads of trees to, to try and combat climate change, we need to know what kinds of trees and where they're going to grow, how they're going to grow. They, they, you know, the, in a few decades when the temperatures are different, are they going to be able to cope? Um, so it's back and forth. It's got to be um, the two things tackled together. Yeah, and um, there, there's been quite a lot in the media uh, recently about the impacts of global heating on the Amazon rainforest, yeah. and then how that yeah. becomes uh, kind of a, a self, a self um, perpetuating circle, like a you know a destructive circle. A, a negative will. feedback, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's 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 kind of terrifying when when you look at these these big ecosystems like the Amazon, and if the Amazon goes from being a, a forest to a savanna. Uh, from capturing carbon to emitting carbon and then the knock-on that can have on global uh, climate uh, air flows and currents and, and it's terrifying. Um, the, the balance of attention that climate seems to get over over bio biodiversity, uh, like clearly, like it's, we've been like almost entirely entirely dominated by by the whole like the one that one molecule molecule of carbon. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about the balance? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 we have become uh, very carbon uh, tunnel visioned in terms of, of dealing with environmental issues. Um, and, and I think if we put all of our effort and all of our focus into carbon, one, we're not tackling the climate issue fully and properly anyway, um, but we're missing all of these other issues. So, so we really need to be cautious about only focusing on carbon and carbon reduction. Um, and that might seem a, an easy thing to do, well, it's not easy, but a, a, a simple thing to do to reduce carbon, brilliant job done, everything's sorted. If we do reduce carbon in the atmosphere, um, there's a danger that might not fix everything uh, and people will become disillusioned. You know, so, so I think we need to, we need to communicate that complexity um, and that it's not just about carbon without overwhelming people, which is, it's, it's a real challenge. Very difficult. Um, and, it, and it's also, you also do end up running up against an inherent conflict. It's like, for example, if you're, if you're developing, um, you know, in, in my, my, own, my own industry, developing wind farms, yeah. like, you need to be really careful about the biodiversity. Run. There will be birds you need to worry about. There'll be bats you need to worry yeah. about. There'll be th things that you'll be having an impact upon yeah. your, your, your 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 ecosystem around you. But you've you've talked about you know how trying to form kind of win-win situations. Yeah. So I mean, the wind farms are, and 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 now upcoming as well, solar farms um, are really interesting in terms of that sort of conflict, potential conflict between biodiversity and climate aims. Um, I think you know we focus on birds and bats in terms of, of wind farm impacts. The other impacts, of course, they have are you know structural in the ground of the the turbines and how they're placed and and, and the impact that has on on the uh, the habitat in which they're positioned. Um, I think there can be win wins. We're trying to develop ways to try and understand what the impacts of of the, the turbines actually are in an Irish context um, and how do we mitigate that? Can we turn the turbines off at certain times of the day or periods of the year to, to minimise impacts? Can we create um, ways of, of, of drawing the, the animals that may be at risk away from those areas? Can we create diverse ecosystems underneath the turbines you know you can have this beautiful utopian view of, of these wonderful turbines and a load of flowers underneath and the bees and the birds buzzing happily around is that just a dream or is that something that can be done and I think that those are the kind of things that we're trying to explore at the moment and the same with the solar panels you know you, you see a, a field covered in solar panels and you're thinking great that's that's not fossil fuels coming out of the ground but what's all those materials that have gone into those solar panels and what's happened to the soil underneath and the plants that were in the field and, and is the reflection from those panels that's confusing the navigation of the birds or the bees or whatever is flying above, you know. And so these are all new questions. We don't know the answers to these questions. Um, I suppose the precautionary principle is is to, to you know, to, to, to proceed with caution. And, and going back to that idea about diversity, is like we don't want to cover the whole landscape in wind farms. We don't want to cover the whole landscape in solar panels, just like we don't want to cover the whole landscape in, in a single species of tree or a single species of grass. Or, 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 or an urban landscape, uh, you know, so it's, it's about diversity at a landscape level as well. Uh, and, and that takes coordination and planning 
uh, and uh, engagement and collaboration um, that doesn't necessarily always always exist. Well, uh, you mentioned earlier on that you know, the idea of uh, like unintended consequences. Um, and it's you know, a really important point and really important to come to, to bear in mind that like bioeconomies aren't necessarily circular and in a lot of cases yeah. you've ended up doing well-intentioned things yeah. that have been as destructive as, um, as, 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 as what it was uh, replacing. And what can we do to be improving that process? Um, yeah, absolutely, and I think you know the bioeconomy is a very attractive idea, but it can it can just be linear. You know, we're just replacing that bio at the beginning. Uh, you know, old bio, which is fossils, with, with new bio, which is plants that are or, or other organisms that are growing now. Um, we need to think about how those bio resources are produced in the first place, um, and and you know if if that's a very linear process of production, then then that's not sustainable. Um, we need to think about what happens to those bio resources at the end of the process and, and, and they need to come back in and, and stay in circulation. So the idea of biocircularity is that it's a circular economy that is biofueled, uh, and I mean by biological resources rather than burning biological materials, um, rather than fossil fueled, you know, from plastics or whatever. Um, and, and so a circular bioeconomy um, has great potential, but I think if we just take pieces out of that bioeconomy and look at them in, in individually, then it's not necessarily going to work. You need to think about the whole process and it needs those connections. And I think one of the difficulties at the moment is that the, the infrastructure that's needed isn't there yet. So whilst there's potential in pockets, it's not necessarily being joined up and realised. Um, and, and, and that's I think probably comes back again to our decision making on money um, and and that sometimes it's more expensive for some of those processes so so they're not happening so I think we're getting there but again it's do we have time to to, to get there so the single greatest uh, thing that's happened in the climate mm -hmm. uh, fight has been at uh, the tipping point where you end up having renewable energy uh, cost competitive and then um, cheaper ultimately in most parts of the parts of the world uh, to, to traditional fossil fuels. Yep. That just made it a no-brainer. Um, to get to the same place in uh, by the biocircularity world, mm. um, do you need to have the, a big technological breakthrough or is it all about academic and be better understanding of the systems which are inherently going to be more complicated than a, sim than a single by getting electrons down a pipe. Yeah, no, it's. I think there's the, there's the technical stuff, but there's also the 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 framework it's in, and and, and absolutely as you say that that sort of that financial framework uh, that that exists is really really important. So once once it becomes uh, cheaper to do the better thing, then the better thing will happen. Once it's more expensive to do the better thing, then it, it, it won't happen. So it's about how we price things. Um, and, and, and it comes back to that sort of polluter pay, pays principle. So at the moment, as, a, as a, um, an industry, um, if you're causing damage to the environment through your industry, you're not necessarily capturing that damage in the price of the product that you sell. If we get to a polluter pays principle and, and that environmental damage is captured in, in the price or the cost of, of, of the product, then we can start to get that, that change around that we've seen in, in the energy sector. So I think we can learn a lot from, from I mean, it took a long time to, to get to carbon pricing. Um, we, don't, we don't have that luxury. We need to get there a bit more quickly, but hopefully we can learn uh, from, from what's happened in, in, the, in the climate side. And like language is enormously important about how we how we talk about these things. Mm. I know in in the climate side, we're very much like <sighs> sustainability as a concept is 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 kind of the dominant mm. uh, dom dominant way we talk about things. Um, but uh, in biodiversity, it's a lot more again a lot more complicated because we're talking about a lot more things than 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 carbon carbon electrons. Um, what type of language do we need to be to be using um, in this world? Well, I think we go back to that word sustainability because I mean, when you think about it, all it means a sustainable system is just one that can keep going. That's 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 so whether that's a climate system, whether that's a, a business system, whether it's an ecological system, it's one that, that keeps going, and that's what we're striving for. So we're ultimately striving for sustainability, and and in the sort of the environmental sphere, we've talked about sustainability for decades as as being these three 
pillars or, or interacting uh, uh, pieces of, of economy, society and environment. Um, and, and I like to think of sustainability as, as, as the, the sort of the wedding cake idea of, of the, uh, the, the environment, the biosphere, the living world underpinning our societies which underpin our economies. And without the bottom layer, you don't have the top layer, it falls you know, into a, into a void. So you have to get that bottom layer right. You have to look after, we have to have a sustainable environmental system to have a sustainable social system, to have a sustainable economic system. So, so that's how I think about sustainability. Um, obviously my focus is very much at that bottom layer, uh, but we need the other layers to be sustainable as well. Um, in, in terms of the language we use around uh, biodiversity, it's, it's, I think as scientists, we use that word biodiversity very precisely. Um, I, I wonder whether nature is a better word to use because it encompasses the living, the non-living, the fact it all interacts. It's, it's, it's a bit of a looser word scientifically, but perhaps a better word for the public. Um, uh, you know, another concept is, is the, uh, the idea of natural capital um, and this is a concept that uses the language of business and politics and economics specifically to bring the idea of nature into those spheres where it's been long neglected and destroyed. Um, so, so I think, I actually think there are different languages for different audiences. So as scientists we can use biodiversity and use it very precisely and know what we mean. Uh, for, for the public, for, for most businesses we can talk about nature. When it comes to decision making I think the natural capital concept is really useful because people understand the idea that if you have a, a stock of capital uh, and you live off the flows from that capital. If you erode that stock, your flows decline. And that's exactly what we're talking about with the natural world, is that we've got these healthy ecosystems with all this diversity doing all this stuff that produces oxygen and flood protection and climate adaptation and, and pollination and all those and spiritual and cultural and medicinal values. Those flows of benefits we get from that stock of natural capital keep our, our, our economies and societies uh, ticking along. If we erode that stock, those flows then diminish. So that language I, th I think is, is useful in certain contexts. Environmentalists, some of them really hate the language of natural capital because we're talking about capital, we're reducing nature to something that can be bought and sold. I think it's so so it's 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 using language in the right way for the right audiences uh, and 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 I suppose as a scientist I'm going to say this being precise about what language you, we're using when and to use a very imprecise analogy going back to the going back to the wedding cake um, the problem with wedding cakes is that humans tend to eat them <laughs> yes um, and if <laughs> we're, we're consumers oh yeah we're massive yeah, 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 yeah. and uh, if we're in the Taking kind of the language of business, like mm. where you you look at things like you know homogenization, simplif simplification, there's tend tend to be sort of seen as positives. You're mass produ you're mass producing, you're, you're yep. reducing costs, whatever else. But those are words that you know that are, you know, that's, that are and, 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 and mass production and simplification and homogenization. These are all the problems. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. They're measures of biodiversity loss. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And and they are the causes of biodiversity loss. Uh, so simplification of a landscape. Uh, you think about uh, the old-fashioned farm with with all the different kinds of you know a field for the cows and a field for the I don't know chickens a field for for for, for potatoes uh, little bits of woodland little uh, drainage ditches and streams and and you know there's 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 diversity there uh, it's not very efficient for the farmer so we've become obs obsessed in in economic growth and efficiency and you know so clear all of that out and plant it all with the same thing and manage it all exactly the same way much more efficient economically much more damaging environmentally so our sort of the way our economic systems and our business models have evolved are very contrary to nature and I think what we need to do, and coming back to this idea of biocircularity, um, is, is take our inspiration from nature. You know, everything in nature is recycled, everything. You know, the energy comes in from the sun, there's production, consumption, and recycling. That's what an ecosystem is, and that's what it does. So we need to take that inspiration uh, and not the, the, the post-industrial um, paradigm of, of, of take, make, dispose. 
because that worked when there was you know fewer human beings on this planet but now there's way too many of us and that's that's not going to work so it's i think taking inspiration from nature for but looking forward to how we apply that there's a kind of fundamental conflict there <laughs> you know that there's I, I like you kind of wonder whether it's even reconcilable but one of the things that you have been um have, we, we, we touched on earlier on is the whole idea of like nat uh, natural capital yeah um how do you think that that can help to reconcile these issues in a place like ireland so the 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 whole point of the natural capital concept is to bring together environmental and economic uh, systems. So we can use the concept of natural capital to create, um, uh, to, to systematize environmental data uh, and bring it up alongside economic data because all our decisions are made on, on economic data and, 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 and they don't necessarily reflect and, and, and have uh, obviously caused uh, the environmental damage that we see. So, so the idea of, of the natural capital approach, and, and we can, uh, in the same way that we can account for uh, economic data through uh, national accounts, system of national accounts, through GDP and, and things that people think they're familiar with, um, we can do the same sort of thing for our, our environmental data and, and, and bring them alongside each other. And that's, that's the whole premise of natural capital accounting, uh, is to bring our environmental data alongside our, our economic data and, and stitch them together. And to try and make this explicit link between our natural resources, the benefits we get from them, the values we have in our economic system and, 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 and the people who, who use them. There's a lot of potential for that to, to just link the two uh, together uh, in terms of the potential for it to be used at a national level. I think it can help with decision making. So, you know, if we look at our accounts and we see that actually uh, things are, are dropping off in, in, in a particular place or, or one particular service is, is is, is not being delivered anymore, then we can you know, change the way we're managing things so that we can restore the capital and restore the services. Um, that would be in, a, in, a, in, a, in an ideal world, that's how it would be used. Um, I think in terms of, at a smaller scale, it's quite difficult uh, to, to actually implement and use. Um, and that's something we're trying to explore at the moment in the research is can we, can we actually use this to make decisions? Because a lot of decisions are made at the small scale. So an individual business or an individual landowner is making a decision, and, and there's lots of them all making those decisions independently. Um, so we need the kind of the overarching policy framework that will steer that decision making in the right direction. And we need those decisions to be informed at a local level as well. So I, th I think there is great potential, but again, is there time? for us to figure out how to do that. Yeah, and it sounds like something that's enormously difficult to, to boil down into a number. Like with the, the, yeah, the and not everything can be boiled down into a number. Yeah, the pro of GDP is that we know what we're talking about and we know if it's going up or down and say, oh, it's, it's going down, well, why? And so, yeah. well, we've got kind of less, our chemical sector has taken a hit because post-COVID, yeah. whatever, it's, yeah. it's less exports. So you can, you can kind of understand that. Much more difficult on, on but that's, the, that, but that's the, the ambition of the natural capital accounting is to say, uh, you know, actually our, um, you know, maybe we're looking at our uh, physical health. Our physical health is declining. Why is that? Um, you know, is it because of a, a loss of um, physical fitness, because of a loss of ac access to the outdoors, because people don't have any green space? You, you know, so, so it's kind of, it's, you can look at that end and work back and see how the, the natural world needs to be managed to, to restore that service. The difficult thing is in measuring everything and, and, and not everything that's important can be measured. I think this, the step we're at at the moment is that even getting it onto the, even if we can't measure it, just getting it onto a list saying this is important. We don't know how important. Uh, we, we, we don't know exactly what the, the, the number attached to it is, but it is important it's on our list, whereas before it wasn't there. Fair enough, yeah. yeah. No, it's a wonderful, wonderful. I do hope at some point in the future there will be, you know, that you'll listen to the radio, if there is a radio at that time, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you won't just be hearing about GP numbers, you'll also be hearing about, about yeah. you know, natural capital And I think that's the problem is we're, we, you know, everyone thinks they know what GDP is. Um, I don't think they do. It's reported on the radio like we should all be experts in, in uh, national accounts and we're not um, it's you know and there's, there's there's all sorts of things that are reported 
daily on the radio about financial markets and yeah, we don't know what that means. Most people don't really know what that means. Uh, why don't we have a report every day that tells us about uh, the, the environment and, and, and what's going up and what's going down and, and you know we've, we've, heard, we've heard this summer about the hottest month, the driest month, the wettest month. Um, we, we're starting to hear those things, but it's not every day. It's not a standard part of every news bulletin, whereas the economic stuff is. So even bringing it up into every conversation, um, you know, we, we, we have a pollen count. Oh, that's kind of a start, <laughs> but it's, it's, you know, it's, I, think, I think we just need to really elevate it to, to, to the level of importance that it that it that it has yeah and yeah like the mere idea that economic growth is more important than you know the health of the nation it to me is completely absurd yeah. but modern economic theory was developed at a time where there were way fewer people and way more resources on the planet um and and infinite growth is not possible on a finite planet and we don't have other planets i mean there are other planets we can't live on them we can't breathe on them um you, you know, it, 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 sometimes I do wonder, but I think it's fabulous to explore our solar system and, and, and you know, just to, for the curiosity, that's what makes us human. But the effort and the, the resources that are put into that could be put into looking after the one planet that we do have. Um, and, and, and the way that our lifestyles are and the way that most other people on the planet would wish their lifestyles to be requires more resources than our planet has. So our modern approach and economic way of doing things doesn't make sense. Just, it just doesn't make physical sense. Um, and so there has to be a change. Yeah. Or, or what's, the, what's the alternative? Yeah, we all naturally stop growing when we hit 1890. If we didn't, <laughs> like we'd be five times taller when we're 100 years old, and that is just not. There's like always a, limits to growth. It has to be. Yeah, yeah. It has to be. And that was the, you know, that was the the title of that that influential report back in the last century. At this stage, you know, the limits to economic growth. It's we were on a finite planet. Mm -hmm. And how do you think about the? Because there's there's clearly again going back to the kind of almost a unifying theme of this, like a conflict between kind of economics and um, and, and the, the, the natural world. But yet we talk about kind of climate, um, we talk about the, the, the label of, of natural capital, so framing mm. nature in economic terms. Yeah. Like, how do you feel about that? Is that not something that's a little uncomfortable? <laughs> or? Um, I think it's for particular audiences and it's for particular uses. Um, I think we need to bring nature into our business and political decision making. It hasn't been there, it needs to be there. So if we have to use the language of business and politics to get this issue into the debate, then yes, let's use it. It's not just a nice to have, it's a fundamental part of our, our, our lives and our economies. Um, so, so if we have to use that language, uh, that's my opinion anyway, is, is that that's, what, that's why I've embraced this concept. Um, yes, I'm uncomfortable bringing everything down to something that we can be traded and, and, and um, bought and sold and, and valued with a monetary uh, approach, but I guess it's, it's, it's a way. Uh, and it's, it's a way that, that's, that's opened doors that weren't open before. And if there's one, so obviously we're talking about an enormously kind of complex um, you know, set, of, set of factors here, uh, all, all interconnected. Um, but if people want to try and take away from, from this, this conversation kind of a one message or like one frame that might, might help um, them to think a bit more in the kind of, with a more kind of ecological perspective on the world, would, is it possible to kind of come up with, with, with one piece of advice? One or, piece of advice. Yeah. Um, uh, appreciate diversity um, and, and this, uh, I suppose, and this idea of connectivity and, and complexity. Be, be comfortable with complexity, maybe that's, and not knowing, you know, nobody knows everything about everything. Um, so, so, you know, appreciating diversity, being comfortable with complexity um, and, and just taking that view that, that we are part of nature, not separate to it. Brilliant, yeah, yeah, and also kind of taking on the, as you said earlier on, taking on the lessons from the from the complexity, adjusting and 
doing our best. Absolutely. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks very much, Jane. Very really enjoyed that. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for uh, joining us on that conversation. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, we hope that you uh, learned something. Uh, if you did enjoy it, please feel free to leave a five-star review and uh, to subscribe to, uh, to any of our channels. And uh, we'll be sure to keep you updated on future productions. This series is produced by United Renewables in collaboration with the London Business School Alumni Energy Club.